Okay, before we get into this video, I have a little bit of an announcement, wickedandwire.com. Now, this is something me and my wife have worked on for a long time now. If you guys enjoy handmade items, like maybe dolls, bags, hats, witch brooms, and other similar things, I promise you'll love this. Inspired by Wiccan culture and oddities, everything on this site is going to be one of a kind. When you buy it, it's gone and we will make new ones, but it's going to be different. Every item is going to be different, obviously, besides the clothing. The clothing, obviously, you know, it's clothing. And also those people who are interested in Sad Girl Apparel, we actually bought all of the stock that we have left and we are going to put it on the site and sell it at half price. It's not on the site yet, but that's what we're working on doing now and everything's gonna be sold on half price. Like for example, our Christmas sweaters, a $50 value, something we used to sell for $50 is actually going to be sold for $20 on the site right now. So get it while you can. And soon we will be selling coffee as well. That's like the wired portion of Wicked and Wired. Like right now we are just like starting out. We're starting a little bit small and we are going to be adding stuff as time goes on. And yes, we do ship international. We just figured that out and everything's working. And I know a lot of you are thinking, oh, the holiday seasons, what if I want to get it for a gift? Is it going to make it here in time? Yes, I don't really necessarily know how long it takes for international, but at least for domestic in America, it definitely will get to you before Christmas if you order it soon because we're doing all of the processing and shipping ourselves. We don't have to worry about any third party company. Me and my wife are doing all the shipping ourselves. Also, if you guys wanna keep up whenever we post new items, you know, dolls, any other handmade things that we're going to be putting on the site, make sure to go to the Instagram, Wicked and Wired. I, the link will be in the description or on here somewhere. Make sure to follow that Instagram and you'll be updated on when we post new items. There'll also sometimes be items that we might not put on the site that we'll sell specifically on Instagram. So if you guys wanna do that, go check that out. Thank you so much. Let's get to the video. The Leica Studios, as you guys mostly know if you watch my channels, created some of my favorite movies of all time. Coraline, Paranorman, Box Trolls, and Kubo. And every single one of these movies I have reviewed. You get it if you want to go back and you know watch watch some watch, watch some of my video, watch go back and watch it. But there's one movie, a missing link if you will, that I have needed to watch for a while. And that is of course the missing missing link. That's the, that was a joke because it's the I didn't want you got it, you get what I'm saying. Which I feel like out of all the Leica movies, The Missing Link is probably the least talked about next to probably Box Trolls. And after watching this movie, I could kind of see why people don't talk about it as much. Now, don't get me wrong, not saying this movie is bad in the slightest. I honestly think the movie is great. It's fun, it's adventurous, it's honestly funny at a lot of times. I've, I've even laughed out loud, I literally quite a few times. And the visuals are always amazing. I mean, it's like, a, it's to be expected. The director and writer of this movie, Chris Butler, was actually heavily inspired by movies like Indiana Jones and Around the World in 80 Days. Just that classic adventure type movie. You got the charismatic main character that is uh, going on a big adventure with his sidekick and you know, you know that whole spiel. Now, whereas I would consider this the, the least ad adventitious of the bunch when it comes to movies with Laika, this movie actually had a lot of tough parts like there was a scene where there were in like a snowy area in the mountains apparently just that one scene took an entire year actually over a year to complete by how difficult it was and something else that really sets this movie apart from the other like movies is the fact that it has zero child characters which i feel like pretty much all like movies have like a child main character to bank on that you know whimsical childlike wonder type deal so the tone of this movie is way different compared to most like movies where a lot of previous titles have that whimsical a uh, fantasy element to it this one's very grounded and more mature in the writing there's like a real danger of getting chased down and killed by a hitman. Like this has a lot of real life problems. Whereas, you know, for example, Paranorman, you got zombies, you got witches to worry about, you got magic stuff going on. Coraline, you got a bell dam in a different world trying to kill you. Box trolls, you got a child raised by trolls that live in boxes. And of course, Kubo is, is probably the most magical out of all of the bunch. But honestly, you could consider Mr. Link or Susan, or Sasquatch, or whatever you want to call him. He's kind of a childlike character in a way because he's very innocent, and he has that childlike naivety throughout the movie. Hugh Jackman actually plays the main character, Sir Lionel Frost, who I would compare this character to kind of Sherlock Sherlock Holmes, Holmes, maybe Indiana Jones style. Very charismatic, very smart, quick-witted, can outsmart uh, a lot of his enemies. And I really do like this character. Throughout the film, he starts, you know, he's very pompous. He's very like, ah, look at me. Oh, oh. Oh, 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 never, never, 
Never trying that accent again. He starts off pompous, overconfident. After a while, character development happens. And then he realized, wow, that was stupid. I shouldn't be that guy. I feel like Frost's development is the main focus of this film and kind of the high point, like him growing into a, a, a more uh, authentic human rather than a, a selfish, uh, charismatic asshole. I honestly feel like the villain of the movie was kind of weak because it was just very basic. Just mean bad guy hires Hitman to kill Sir Lionel Frost so he doesn't get to his goal of finding evidence of Sasquatch. However, I do feel like the Hitman was probably the more entertaining of the villains, even though he wasn't technically the main villain of the movie. He brought a lot of entertainment and a lot of suspense to the film. And we also have Zach Galifianakis, who plays Mr. Link, who is Sasquatch, which is a quite big contrast to what you would assume a large uh, a, a primate being would what be you know sounding about? like. But Mr. Link, like I said before, is basically just an innocent child trying to find his uh, home in a way. Or more importantly, trying to find where he belonged, which is a very big topic of this movie. Now, something interesting about the Mr. Link doll is he was the most complicated doll to date, which I mean, you know, Missing Link is the most recent like a movie. It actually took over a year to figure out his setup as, you know, he doesn't really have a neck and his body's in the shape of an avocado, so he's not a normal doll. And also the fact that he's covered in hair, and there's actually a video that shows them meticulously painting every little, like, rubber I think it's silicone piece of hair, especially just thinking about having to move each piece in order to, you know, show the wind blowing and, and his hair moving. It would be extremely tedious. But since I have finally finished watching this movie, I've completed my collection of Leica Studio movies. And actually, if you stick around until the end of this video, I'll be rating every single Leica movie in order, you know, my best one, least favorite one, all that. If you guys want to stick around to the end and watch that. But like I said before, this movie is very grounded which actually the director wanted to go for a more live action feel, which is not anything that like has really ever done before. They normally go fantasy, mystical, whimsical type stuff. But this really just felt like a live action movie and emphasis on action. I feel like there's a lot of great action scenes that are well choreographed and just well done. The scenery is beautiful as always. The message of instead of trying to fit in with society or within an idea of what you believe that you should be, you should just be yourself, which I feel like the movie portrays that very well. And the ending really leaves you with a warm and fuzzy feeling. But the movie starts out with the introduction to Sir Lionel Frost on his journey to catch a picture of the Loch Ness Monster. And the whole beginning scene really sets the stage for what to expect with this movie. Because the very beginning of the movie is very funny and also it shows Sir Lionel Frost's skill set. And it also shows how little Frost cares about his sidekick or really people in general. Because at the beginning, he forces his sidekick to wrangle down the Loch Ness Monster by himself while he tries to set up a camera to take a picture. And as his sidekick was taken down to the bottom of the lake, Sir Lionel Frost actually was able to swim down and save his, his sidekick in the end, showing his, you know, skill set. However, obviously this leads to his sidekick kind of just being like, bro, uh, I almost died multiple times hanging out with you. You don't give a shit about me. I'm out. Which really shows Frost's character in the beginning. He doesn't give a shit about anybody. He just wants to finish his goal at, with any means necessary. But he's actually doing all of this, trying to discover these mystical creatures in order to get into the Optimates Club, a group of esteemed adventurers, explorers, and great men. And obviously Frost wants more than anything just to be a part of this club, just so he can be considered a great man and a great adventurer. But the problem with that is every guy in this club, they're complete assholes. And I wouldn't really consider them adventurers. They're more of poachers. As you see all over the walls, there's pictures of them standing on corpses of dead animals. There's animals that have been taxidermied everywhere around them. So they don't really care about this discovery of these creatures. They just care about killing them and using them as a trophy. And it is led by the yellow teethed British man known as Lord Pickett Dumpsby. And it is pretty clear that Frost is a laughing stock to this group. I mean, you know, it's that classic case of crazy man believes in these mystical creatures that he's never going to find out about. But Frost receives a letter, a letter telling him the location where he could find Sasquatch. So he goes to these men and tells them that he is going to find proof of this Sasquatch. And obviously Piggott finds this quite hilarious, but they actually come to a conclusion that if so Frost finds evidence of the Sasquatch, then he will be invited into the group and placed amongst the great adventurers. So as Frost sets out, 
out on his goal to find Bigfoot, Piggott ends up hiring a hitman because he is worried that Frost will actually figure it out. Or at least he shows that he's not worried about it and that he just wants to make sure, you know. Yeah. So as you can see, the club is full of a bunch of losers and just bad people. And Frost is literally just trying to find his place in society and almost putting on a front because he obviously is nothing like them in the slightest but he's just trying to put on that facade. So he makes his way to this old Western town, which is where he was led to by this letter in search of the Sasquatch. And as he follows these directions, he actually does end up finding the Sasquatch and he discovers that the Sasquatch was the one who actually wrote the letter to him. And we immediately find out that the Sasquatch, or I'm going to refer to him as Mr. Link for the rest of the movie, he is not what you think he would be. What he would expect to be a large, aggressive, just growling monster turns out to just be a well-spoken, hairy creature. And as I said before, Mr. Link wrote this letter to Frost, so he was hoping Frost would help him find his family because he's actually by himself in these woods. And then Mr. Link starts talking to him about these creatures in the Himalayas that are pretty similar to him, and Frost obviously realizes he's talking about you. And so they come to an agreement. If Frost helps him find his family, then he will give him all of the evidence he needs in order to get into the Adventurer's Club. And so their journey begins. And their first stop will be the house of a friend of Frost who ended up dying because because he was in pursuit of the Yetis. And his friend actually created a map in his discovery of finding the Yetis. But first they try to stay the night in the little shanty town, end up getting in, into a bar fight because the hitman appeared stank. Yeah. His name's Stank. And then we get to see a little bit more of the swag that Frost has as he completely discombobulates the Stank. Two legends in one day. Oh, I wouldn't count on it. So Frost goes to Adelina Fortnite's home, who is the widow of uh, his friend who died. And Frost is in search of this map, which she has locked away in a safe. And here we can really see the selfishness and obsession Frost has for finding these creatures because he shows absolutely no sympathy for his friend who has passed. And he even hits on Miss Fortnite and tries to woo the widow while he just shows no care for his friend who passed. And he really comes off just like a pompous douchebag in this part. So Adelina obviously kicks them out and Frost actually uses Link to break into the house and get the map. And obviously not being light footed with Mr. Link being a Sasquatch, they end up getting caught, but they were able to get away with the map. So as Frost and Mr. Link were about to board a train to get away, Adelina actually was able to catch up to them. And before Adelina could shoot Frost, they actually get into a firefight with the hitman who ends up showing up, but they actually end up giving Stank the slip. He believed that they got on the train. So he gets on the train and Adelina tells them that if they're going to take the map, then she's going with them in order to help. And throughout the journey, Frost just becomes more and more selfish and kind of just, again, a douchebag. He constantly makes these moves toward Adelina every time she speaks of her passing husband, almost using her husband passing as like a sympathy thing to get her to, you know, lean her head on his shoulder type deal. And on top of that, he's pretty blatant on how the only reason he's helping Mr. Link is for his own benefit and he actually doesn't give a shit about anybody. And throughout the movie, Adelina continually tells him like, yo, you need to stop being like this. You need to change. You need to realize how selfish you're being. He really needs to see what's in front of him and help out Mr. Link because, you know, he's being an asshole. And, I, and I'll take this moment to talk about how much I love Adelina's character. Like she's strong and she's very very smart. She's not just, you know, for lack of a better phrase, a damsel in distress. She constantly plays the role of more of a babysitter of Frost and Mr. Link throughout the movie. And she could hold her own in pretty much any fight. I would say she's probably my favorite character in this movie. But anyway, Mr. Frost and Mr. Link have a little moment of uh, them talking to each other, uh, learning a little bit about each other. And then they come to the conclusion that Mr. Link should come up with his own name so he can have an identity. And then he comes up with the name Susan. And this happy little moment was interrupted by none other than Stanky Stank. And then we get another little scuffle with the group and Stank. And this sequence right here of them getting chased around the boat as they're dealing with these massive waves is such a great action sequence. I would say most Like A Movies has some of the best action sequences or at least choreographed wise. Like the part of them running down the hallway and the ship kind of moving sideways and they have to run on the walls and back and forth, almost like you know the inception hallway where it's going around in circles. It's just a really great scene and I love it. But anyway, after they're able to escape again, they make it to the small town in search of someone named Gamu and Gamu's supposed to be able to tell them where 
Shangri-La is, which is what they call the place with all the Yeti. And after showing Gamu, you know, Susan, the Sasquatch, she's like, okay, I'll finally tell you where it's at because, you know, it's Sasquatch and shit. And as they head towards Shangri-La in order to find the Yetis, lo and behold, Mr. Stank ends up holding Gamu at gunpoint and he threatens her to tell him, you know, where the Yeti are. But in this situation, it's not just Stank this time. Actually, Piggott shows up and he decides to, instead of threatening Gamu or Gamu's chicken, that he should threaten her granddaughter. Yeah, Piggott's kind of a piece of shit. So after a lot of treacherous landscape, Frost, Adelina, and Susan end up making it to Shangri-La. Shangri-La? That is not our name. We call it... <laughs> And as it just so happens, the Yetis do not want to accept anyone, not even Susan, because they consider Susan a redneck or hillbilly. Because, you know, they, they run the whole spiel of humanity kind of destroys the land and we use it for a prize rather than actually appreciating it for what it is, which, yeah, obviously she has a pretty strong point there. And also they don't want anyone else to discover their location. So they end up throwing them to the pit. And in this pit, Adelina starts dropping some fat truth bombs on Frost. She starts telling telling him that he only cares for himself and how other people perceive him and that he doesn't even care about finding the creatures. He just cares about the, the adoration he'd get for being a part of that club and also the fact that that club is full of a bunch of losers and why would he care to be a part of it if it's just a bunch of losers? And then we start seeing the parallel of Susan and Frost where they both kind of just want to find a home. Where Frost was searching for a way into the club, Susan was searching for a family, you know, the Yetis, and then they both figured out that that's not what they wanted at all in the first place. The true family is the friends we made along the way. And this obviously clicks with Frost that he's been doing this like outward douchey uh, attitude just to kind of hide his uh, actual shame and confusion of what he actually wants. So after he comes to that conclusion and realizes that he is only there to help Susan, not himself, they finally escape. And as they are escaping, they run into none other than Piggott and Stank. And we get a nice scene of Frost telling Piggott he cares not about being a part of the club anymore, and he realizes that they're just a bunch of elder and confides that Susan is more of a man than Piggott will ever be, which I would say that Susan is the most human character in the movie. You, you see what I, see what, you, that was, whatever. And Piggott's response is attempting to kill everybody. <laughs> if I can't have it, no one can. He tries to destroy the ice bridge and in turn accidentally just kills himself because everyone just runs off the bridge while he's trying to break it and then he falls through, which is well-deserved. And this next scene is some of the most suspense I've seen out of this movie and most of Leica movies. Just the full sequence of them almost falling to their death, which I just want to mention, Frost has some incredible upper body Body strength, the fact that he could hold Adelina and a 600 pound Susan with one hand, like a one fingertips, pretty impressive. But they end up getting into a little scuffle with Stank where Stank is like falling off and then they switch places where Susan's holding on and, and Frost isn't holding on. And it's just like a back and forth consistently, who's gonna fall, who's gonna die. And then in the end, Stank ends up dying in a horrible way. A giant ice pick just pierces his chest and he falls all the way down to his death. So the movie ends on a fantastic note because, you know, Susan realizes that his family was the, the friends that he made along the way, you know, Frost and Adelina. And another reason why I love this ending so much is you would expect that Frost would end up with Adelina. They'd have like a little romance because it was like hinted throughout here and there where they had like a, no, I don't, I don't like you. And then he keeps, oh, come on, you know you like me type shit. But no, Adelina ain't gonna fall for that shit because as Frost leans in to kiss her at the end. She's like, bitch, no, you ain't getting none of this shit. And, and she decides that she's gonna go on her own journey by herself and find her own uh, life in a way. Because she spent most of her life after her husband's death just mourning and grieving him. And then she realized that she wants to go on an adventure herself. Which is such a great way to end uh, on that note rather than having them have a romance. It, it, it wouldn't feel right if they did. And it would also feel cliche. So at the very end of the movie, Susan kind of just becomes Mr. Link's sidekick as they go exploring for the creatures for themselves. They're not exploring them to gain anything for a goal. They're just doing it for the passion of discovering these mythical creatures. And the next one that they're gonna search for is Atlantis. So a great ending to a great movie. Now it's time. Let's, I, it finally, after all these years, I could rate all of the Leica movies. 
So I'll start at number one and go down to number five. This is my rating of every single one of the Leica movies. Coraline, obviously, is number one. I'm pretty sure most of you could have figured that one out. That is probably my one of my favorite movies of all time. And then in second place, we have Paranorman. That one's just like such a good combination of comedy and all of like the the horror elements with the side of whimsy in there. I just love that movie so much. Now comes the difficult portion because I could easily figure out Coraline and Paranorman. Those are the easy first two. Now the last three are so close when it comes to how much I like them, it's very difficult to say which one I like the most. Now, the reason I'm picking this one as number three is just the spectacle of it, the, the amount of work that went into it, the visuals, and also just the cool magic that went into it. Kubo and the Two Strings is definitely gonna hit a number three for me. And then the last two, oh boy, this one I bounced back and forth with for the longest time. But I would say, after much consideration, I would say, Box Trolls is number four, and obviously The Missing Link is number five. Now, don't get me wrong, I don't consider The Missing Link a bad movie at all. That should just show you how great Laika is. I consider The Missing Link a top tier movie. It's way up there, it's such a great movie. But the thing about it is it's just basic. I, I, I hate to say it, I mean, it is a stop motion movie, the visuals are great, but they didn't really risk anything with it. It felt very, you know, again, like they were going for live action. And me personally, I like the more uh, uh, cool stuff the, the, because I feel like the purpose of animation is to go beyond live action, is to go beyond the grounded versions of real life. And that's why I love animation so much. And honestly, yeah, I would consider Box Trolls a little bit more grounded than the rest of the movies. However, it had like the steampunk style at, in portions and the story was very, very unique. Whereas I felt like The Missing Link was just kind of an Indiana Jones movie. It was just a classic adventure movie and it was a great one. But unfortunately, I would consider out of all of the Leica movies, The Missing Link to probably be my least favorite. And that's just mainly because it just felt like a live action movie. And that's just my personal opinion. So let me know in the comments below, what is your guys' top five? What is your list of these Leica movies? What's your favorite? What's your least favorite? And tell me why. I want to know in the comments below because we finally completed our collection, our, our deck, our Yu-Gi-Oh deck of Leica movies. So if you guys like this video, please make sure to like, please make sure to subscribe. Go watch my other videos of me reviewing the Leica movies if you want to see my opinions on those. And I hope you guys have a fantastic day, except you, Jimmy. What are you, what are you doing there? Ew. I hope you have a terrible day, Jimmy. Yeah, you know who I'm talking to. Yeah. Bye.